Journeyman. It's a term we hear a lot in sports. It's a term devoid of grandeur and stardom, but yet a term rich with respect in reference to longevity. Whether you're a 37-year-old utility infielder or a 12-year special teamer, they'll call you a journeyman. Auto racing is, well, you know, in a journeyman world of its own. It's a sport with no set age limit. A Hall of Fame quarterback is going to be unlikely to play past the age of 40, but a racing driver can have success well beyond the big 4-0. There have even been careers in NASCAR that have spanned several decades. Let's take Ricky Rudd, for example. He began his career in the 70s and retired in the 2000s. But I wouldn't really call Ricky Rudd a journeyman. Journeymen rarely reach the top step of the podium, if ever. While Ricky never won a championship at NASCAR's highest level, he won 23 races and finished in the top 10 41% of the time in a very competitive era. A true journeyman never really finds their footing. There are certain drivers who have never racked up wins or had the stats of the greats, but still manage to hang around for seemingly ever. The hooks of pro racing dig deep in your soul and sometimes just refuse to let you retire. We coined a term on Flashback to the Track, the strange starter. It doesn't take a rocket surgeon to realize that most strange starters are also journeyman drivers. The two go hand in hand, bouncing around the garage, driving for whoever will have them to help them prolong their career. Today, we're about to dive into a case study of perhaps the strangest starter in NASCAR history, Mr. Mike Bliss. Just a regular guy from the Pacific Northwest that hung on and on for what seemed like an eternity. An undying spirit that refused to float away on the breeze. 744 races in NASCAR's top three series, but a legacy few take the time to appreciate. Mike Bliss, a strange starter. So not a lot is known about Mike Bliss's early career in racing and how he got into the sport. Now we couldn't track Mike down for an interview, hopefully someday we will. Mike did however mention in an interview with Jeff Gluck that he raced quarter midgets when he was 16, so under today's standards he started quite late. We learned through an episode of the Rip the Fence podcast that Bliss also drove late models in his teens. He worked his way up from late models to sprint cars and then winged sprint cars. He eventually raced in the USAC Silver Crown in the early 1990s. So we can actually say that he had a pretty conventional road to NASCAR. He even won the 1993 USAC Silver Crown Championship. Shortly after, Mike met up with Jim Smith, the owner of Ultra Racing Wheels, who was about to start a truck series team that will become one of the most legendary teams in the series history. So that brings us to 1995. Well, actually 1994. Mike made his unofficial debut in the 1994 Truck Series Winter Heat Exhibition Race at Tucson, finishing 11th for Jim Smith in the number 08 Ford. Then we get to 1995 and Mike ends up driving in 19 of the 20 inaugural Truck Series races for Jim Smith. He ends up winning at North Wilkesboro, earning 12 top 10s and finishing 8th in points. From 1996 to 1998, Mike continues racing for Jim Smith's Ultra Motorsports truck team in the number 2 Team ASC Ford. He finished top 10 in points all 3 years and rack up 5 more wins for the team. And his wins came with some cool racetracks too, tracks like Evergreen in Washington State and I-70 Speedway. He also made his Cup and Bush Series debut during this time, even earning a top 10 finish in the Bush Series at IRP, driving for Michael Waltrip in the Band-Aid car. His Cup debut came for American Equipment Racing in the number 96 Caterpillar Chevy. Waltrip hit Mike Bliss, who is making his inaugural NASCAR Winston Cup start. 1999 brought the first real change of scenery for Mike as he signed on to drive Roush Racing's number 99 Ford in the Truck Series. This gave Mike a championship caliber teammate in Greg Biffle to measure himself against. Bliss would end up with one win at Topeka, and he finished 10th in points for his second straight season. There was a bit of controversy in his time at Roush though, as many people felt Mike didn't do enough as a teammate to help Biffle win the title over Jack Sprague. Biffle would end up losing by just 8 points, and many looked at the final race at Fontana as an example of Bliss not really helping Biffle out. Biffle can't get around his X-Side 4 teammate, coming out of turn 4, last year Jack Sprague lost the championship while winning the race. This year, Jack Sprague looks like he is going to win the race and the championship. But to be fair, Biffle's team was fined 120 points after the Las Vegas race for having illegal components on their truck. So can we really blame Mike Bliss for an 8 point loss in the championship? 1999 also saw Bliss run a couple more cup races, 
an Eel River Racing's number 30 Pontiac, and three more Busch Series starts for two different team owners. Although Bliss finished 10th in points in trucks and only won a lone race, he did enough to impress American racing legend AJ Foyt into signing him on for a full-time Cup Series ride in 2000. So it's the year 2000. Y2K didn't actually kill all of us, and people have stocks and stocks of toilet paper to last them for years. And Mike Bliss is about to begin the stage of his career that every young driver dreams of. He's about to be a full-time Cup Series driver. Not only was he a full-time Cup driver, but he was also going to drive for a legendary owner in AJ Foyt. Mike started off the season with a 33rd place finish in the Daytona 500 and proceeded to DNQ for the next three events and was subsequently fired from the team. Just like that, it looked like his Cup career was over after just a few weeks. But it's always darkest before the dawn, right? Well, Bliss's dawn wasn't all that bright after all, but he did find employment in the Cup Series again by the eighth race of the season at Martinsville. He signed with Eel River Racing, which came from the ashes of the former Tabasco Fiasco team. They were sponsored by Viagra because, of course they were, and Bliss would end up making 24 starts for the team. He'd actually earn a top 10 finish at Talladega, but he ended the season with an average finish of 31. To be fair, AJ Foyt and Eel River Racing were not at all top tier teams, so we can't really blame Mike's lack of success solely on his driving ability. Now, there are ups and downs in every driver's career. 2000 was the beginning of a pretty massive low for Bliss, as he'd spend 2001 making just two starts in NASCAR's top three series. One Bush Series start for Steve Riddling at Daytona, and a truck start at South Boston for Express Motorsports. But while times were dark in 2001, Bliss was about to emerge from the clutches of darkness and re-establish himself as a championship caliber driver. That brings us to 2002. Now there are a lot of drivers and honestly just regular people in the workforce that refuse to go back to a lower level position if they lose their upper level job. You don't see many fired CEOs looking for jobs in the mailroom and you don't see a lot of cup drivers flunk out of cup and sign full-time truck deals. But that's exactly what Mike Bliss did. He wanted to race and race he would, albeit in a truck. Sometimes you just need a full factory reset to get back on track. Mike signed on with Express Motorsports for the 2002 Truck Series season. In 22 races, he would earn 18 top 10s, 5 wins, and ultimately win the championship. That's right, he went from unemployed Cup Series driver to Truck Series champion in less than two years. Oh yeah, and he also drove Sterling Marlin's Coors car at Martinsville in a, like, a really confusing substitution scenario where like Jamie McMurray was supposed to fill in, but he couldn't because he had a prior commitment. But anyway, Bliss finished 14th, so like that's cool. At age 36, Mike had done the unthinkable. He had climbed from the depths of hell on earth and made it all the way to the top of the mountain. Well, the Truck Series mountain, anyway. Although he was in his mid-30s and a very late bloomer, Mike's career was now on the up and up. In 2003, Bliss is going to sign on to drive for Joe Gibbs Racing in the Bush Series. He'll drive the number 20 Chevy, well, actually, it was a Pontiac at the restricted plate races because they had more downforce and you were still allowed to run that body. But anyway, he now has an opportunity in NASCAR's number 2 Series to show what he can do in some very competitive equipment. He ended up having eight top fives throughout the season, along with 14 top tens. He also drove in the summer Daytona Cup race in a number 80 Joe Gibbs Chevy, finishing 26th. Now his Bush Series stats don't seem that impressive, but stats only provide one part of the story. There's the all-important addition of context. This was during an era of free and open participation by Cup Series drivers in the lower NASCAR series. Had he been racing with today's rules, you'd like to be looking at an automatic championship contender. This continued in 2004. Wait! I totally forgot to mention that Mike won an IROC race in 2003. Yeah, that's right, he won an IROC race at Chicagoland, so add that to your list of stuff from the weirdest timeline. Mike Bliss is an IROC series winner. And, and don't act like you knew that, because you didn't. You didn't know until I just told you. Mike Bliss won an IROC race at Chicagoland in 2003. Anywho, things continued in 2004. Mike gets another 14 top 10s in the Bush series and earns his first win at Charlotte in the fall. He finishes fifth in points. But the true highlight of 2004 for Mike was a one-off start in a third JGR Cup car at Richmond in the fall. He drove the number 80 Hunt's Ketchup Chevy to a fourth place finish. This proved to many that Mike could be a legitimate contender in the Cup Series. Speaking of the Cup Series, JGR announced they were starting a third full-time Cup team in 2005. It would be the number 11 Chevy sponsored by FedEx. Mike found out soon after that he was not being considered for the seat in the number 11, likely due to his age. The team ended up signing Jason Leffler. 
This led to Bliss signing with Haas CNC Racing shortly after they released Ward Burton. Mike even earned a 10th place finish at Darlington that year in his first race with the team. So now it's 2005 and Mike's back at the pinnacle of NASCAR. He's a full-time Cup Series driver for Haas CNC Racing. This should be a great opportunity. The team has an alliance with NASCAR powerhouse Hendrick Motorsports and uses their motors. They just signed Best Buy as a sponsor to go along with longtime sponsor Net Zero, and he's got a serviceable crew chief in Robert Booty Barker. So things should be just peachy keen, right? Maybe 10 top 10s and fighting for a win or two? Well, things did start off pretty great. He had strong finishes in the first four races, and the team was 13th in points. Then a sort of, well, absolute nosedive commenced for Mike and the team. They're 28th in points by May. Uh, but things kind of looked to be making a turn for the better when Bliss won the pole for the Nextel All-Star Open race and was going to win the race before Brian Vickers dumped him coming to the checkered flag and stole the win. Then the nosedive continued. The team would get just two top tens that season at Pocono and Bristol, with a best finish of seventh. So things were really bleak for Mike and his team in 2005. But Mike had no reason to believe he wasn't coming back for 2006. The team was still relatively young and growing pains were real. Mike had a one-year contract for 2005, but he was under the impression that he'd be back for 2006. This led him to apparently turn down an offer to drive for the new Hall of Fame racing team in 2006, a team part-owned by Roger Staubach and Troy Aikman. Of course, Haas then fired Bliss and he was out of a ride for 2006. Now during 2005, Mike had also returned to his roots briefly and drove trucks again for two different teams, MRD Motorsports and his former team, Express Motorsports. He made five starts overall. This ended up being a sign of things to come. Oh yeah, and he also drove a bush race at Daytona for a team sponsored by gun manufacturers called SKI Motorsports. America. But this is when we start to enter the peak era of Mike Bliss as a strange starter. The era in which he would drive literally anything he could find in the garage. On top of his full crux schedule, Mike also drove eight bush races in 2006 between Frank CC Racing and SKI Motorsports, he earned a best finish at 12th at Texas. He also signed on with BAM Racing to drive their number 49 Dodge in the Cup Series. BAM had had a really rough year that season with a rotating roster of drivers, including the heir to a mattress fortune. He'd make six starts with a best finish of just 23rd. So 2007, new year, new you, right? Well, not for Mike. It was another year of being the strangest of starters. He signs on with BAM again and plans to run the full season of the Cup Series, but ends up leaving the team after struggling to qualify for races. But that wasn't all. Mike also drove the first four truck races for Key Motorsports in the number 40 Chevy, and then signed on as a fill-in driver for Bobby Hamilton Racing in their number four truck. He'd actually do quite well in that truck and finish in the top five four times. Mike also drove in the Bush Series that year for Fitz Motorsports and Braun Racing, earning eight top tens and 24 starts. So he ends 2007 without being full-time in any series and driving for six different owners, but he did prove he was a serviceable fill-in driver who may even have enough steam left to run for a title in bush or trucks. 2008 saw Mike return to full-time competition in the newly renamed NASCAR Nationwide Series, but of course, it was between two different teams. He drove the first six races in Fitz Motorsports number 22 Supercuts Dodge, and then jumped ship to Phoenix Racing's number one Chevy for the remainder of the year. He ended up 5th in points with 15 top 10s. He also dabbled in trucks for 4 different teams. And also ran a cup race for Michael Waltrip Racing in the number 00 Toyota. They'd had a revolving door of drivers late in the year because apparently no one had any idea that maybe Michael McDowell as a full-time cup driver at that point in his career wasn't a good idea. But anyway, if you've been keeping track, Mike has now driven for 26 different car owners. 26. Now, Mike's 2008 nationwide season between two teams was pretty cool, right? Well, in 2009, he ran full-time again, between five different teams. He started off with Phoenix Racing and looked strong, winning his second career race at Charlotte in May, but was released after Iowa. He made a stopgap start for a start and park team at Watkins Glen, and then spent four races with Joe Nemechek's team. He then joined Key Motorsports and alternated between their car and CGM Racing's number 11 Toyota. Oh, and then he drove for McDonald Motorsports for one race and finished the season at Homestead by returning to Phoenix Racing, you know, the team that had fired him. He ended up fifth in points with 15 top 10 finishes and the victory at Charlotte. But of course that wasn't all. Mike also drove for Phoenix Racing's Cup program and made 13 starts between their number 09 car and TRG Motorsports number 71. 
He also drove seven truck races between Key Motorsports and HT Motorsports. So now we're up to 30 different car owners in a career. 2010 was when we begin the sort of fall from grace for Mike Bliss. I mean, if you can call having to drive for five different teams in one season a, a, a grace period. So he drives an all but one nationwide race in 2010, making 31 starts for Key Motorsports in their number 40 and three starts for Kevin Harvick's team, finishing second at Gateway. He also made 17 cup starts and 27 attempts between five different small teams, but he did earn top 10s at Talladega and Daytona for Phoenix Racing and TRG. In 2011, Mike's gonna find some stability again. He'll drive full-time for TriStar Motorsports in the Nationwide Series and earn one top 10. He also made 18 cup starts between FAS Lane Racing, TRG Motorsports, and Phoenix Racing, all of which were underfunded teams at the time who were just trying to survive. At the end of 2011, Mike's 45 years old, and should probably just hang it up, right? Nah. So Mike's gonna spend five more seasons racing in NASCAR's top three series. He'll be full-time for TriStar in the Nationwide, or as it's known now, the Xfinity Series, and continue making starts for a list of cup teams, including TriStar Motorsports, Go Fast Racing, BK Racing, and Hillman Circle Sport. His final cup start will come at the 2015 Southern 500 at Darlington, driving an awesome Harry Gant throwback car for Hillman Circle Sport. In 2016, Mike even returned to the truck series, ran a couple races for Contreras Motorsports, and then made his final truck start for the Mittler brothers. Mike's final start in NASCAR came in an Xfinity race in Kentucky. He drove the number 10 TriStar Motorsports Toyota. He qualified 26th and then parked the car after two laps. Mike had made 743 starts in NASCAR's top three series up to that point, but in his 744th, he was forced to complete just two laps and park it. 744 races. That's an incredible run for any driver, but Mike did it in such a unique way that we may never see another driver like him. Sure, drivers bounce around a lot, but I doubt anyone ever goes to the lengths that Mike Bliss did to get behind the wheel. He drove junk, he started and parked, and even competed for wins on occasion. He had a career with all the dizzying highs and suffocating lows that many aspiring drivers can only dream of. Sure, lots of people on Twitter would say Mike was garbage. After glancing at his stats, they see that he never won a cup race. In fact, there are lots of morons on Twitter that say any driver who never wins a cup title is garbage. But like I said, those people are morons. I would argue that Mike was in a car good enough to win a cup race just one instance in his career. It was that faithful 2004 fall race at Richmond where he finished fourth. He could have won that race in JGR equipment. Other than that, his cup career was hopeless to produce a victory. Oh, Haas CNC Racing had Hendrick Cars and Motors, you say? Great, so did MB2, and how many races did they win from 04 to 06? One, they won one race between two full-time cars. And how many races did Haas win with other drivers from 03 to 08? Zero, they didn't win any. I'll be the first person to say that winning isn't everything in NASCAR. It is so hard to win a race at NASCAR's highest level. There are so many talented drivers that have had long careers but never won a race. But was anyone's career stranger than Mike Bliss? Did anyone drive for that many owners and have just one legitimate opportunity to win a cup race? I doubt it, but I'll gladly take your suggestions in the comments below. Mike Bliss is quite possibly on the short list of strangest starters of all time. The strangest of the strange starters. Oh yeah, and he drove for 39 different team owners over his 744 starts. That's an average of 19 races per owner. And that's insane. You're strange, Mike. Congrats.